Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Soul Row Show. I'm Cherie Burton. This is a podcast where ancient feminine wisdom meets the modern path of soul evolution. And how many times, ladies, have we heard in our lives that being angry is a bad thing, that we need to curtail it, <laughs> that we need to simmer down? Ah, there's so much around that. We're starting to realize now that anger can actually be a very positive vehicle to fuel change, to create good disruption. <laughs> That we're going to explore that today with Bronwyn Schweigert. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She has master's in nutrition and counseling. She has a podcast called Angry at the Right Things, which is an epic name. And we're exploring today how we can transmute the energy of anger and use it to create sustainable change. Our voices and our pain can seek expression in productive ways through the mechanism, believe it or not, of anger. Also, I have a new free whole body healing mini course that you can have access to by asking to join our private Facebook group, Soul Rose Community. Also inside of this community, we have free monthly sessions and classes. The one we have coming up that I'm really excited about on April 8th is on the beautiful eclipse day. And we have an amazing meditation teacher coming in to help us access parts of ourselves to open that portal into the eclipse season. You'll not want to miss that. Again, that's our private Facebook group soul rose community now let's talk about being angry at the right things bronwyn welcome to the soul rose show thank you sheree i am happy to be here i loved our conversation when we talked i don't know when it was a couple weeks ago and I was really piqued when your team reached out about the topic of this because it's something I've been wanting to explore and kind of like destigmatizing anger and how it's shown up for in women's yeah. bodies. So I'm going to introduce you officially to our tribe. You are, you've got quite the credentials. You're a psychotherapist, so you're a licensed marriage and family therapist. You also have two master's degrees, one in nutrition and one in counseling. Yeah. And that's why it's so fascinating to me because you know what happens in the body because you've got that training and you know what's happening on the emotional level because you've got that training, which is like very close to my heart to marry those two, because as mm -hmm. you probably are aware, I'm sure you are, a lot of the illnesses that we're seeing, these chronic illnesses, and I mean, you could say autoimmune, you could say there's just a myriad of things showing up in bodies right now that are mystery illnesses. And I think you and I would both agree that they can be linked to unexpressed emotion, but we're going to focus on anger today and why there is a stigma maybe, especially yeah. with women. I know there's things you see in your practice, but just as a woman yourself, what have you noticed with that stigmatization of anger itself and the expressing of it in the feminine? Yeah. Well, I don't know, like as far as women versus men, because I've never been a man, but I can reflect on my own journey and how I discovered this for myself firsthand. You say I have like this expertise on the body and the mind, which insinuates that those graduate programs actually taught me much. <laughs> and I hate to say they really didn't, yeah. some basic principles, but I actually learned the most through my own very severe depression that I fell into about 15 years ago. My family had just had to move due to the Great Recession, 2009, and relocate about an hour and a half away. It was like the dark side of the moon to me. I might as well have been in outer space because that's how it felt. And I just felt so lonely. I just remember it was right when I put my daughter in school. So she was now five entering kindergarten and I didn't have my job anymore. I didn't have my community. My husband seemed a million miles away. And I just felt so, so alone. And I sank into the most profound depression I've ever heard of, honestly, because what I was doing is my body was just throwing up involuntarily and spontaneously, like all the time. I would be driving on the freeway and I just couldn't pull over because it just would happen. Or I'd be walking down the street, which is really humiliating. A car is like a much safer place to be vomiting involuntarily wow. than walking down the street. It was humiliating. And so my body was just reacting. That was the first extreme depressive episode I had like that. I had a few more after that. But the thing was, I went to several different therapists at the time because I desperately needed it. And even though I was hardly functioning, I remember sitting there, this is when we did in person, thinking, you know, I'm barely functioning, but I'm pretty sure I would be a better therapist than this person. And, you know, I went to multiple people having the exact same experience. So that kind of exacerbated the depression. I wonder why. So looking back, I see how every one of my depressive episodes 
in retrospect was all suppressed anger. And it's usually by a betrayal. The suppressed anger at the therapist was a betrayal because you're supposed to be someone who attunes to me. You're supposed to be someone who really listens and believes me and trusts me and that I can trust someone who really prioritizes my feelings, doesn't try to talk me out of them. So that was a betrayal. The big, big, big depression that I had though, was that my husband in retrospect, I see that, that I was so lonely with this move and I felt like he wasn't attuning to me. Like he was kind of like, what's wrong? Get over it. And so that was the ultimate betrayal in my partner, not really looking me in the eyes and just going, wow, Bronwyn, I see how lonely you are. I see how hard this is for you. If he had just done that, I would have felt a lot better. But because he wasn't doing that and I wasn't able to see this betrayal and to be angry and to feel my anger and connect to it and say, you know, Steve, I'm feeling betrayed by you. And it's okay for me to feel angry because I didn't allow myself to do that and to validate that. That's when the depression hit. Mm, So interesting because as I feel into like how that expresses itself in the collective that we feel this generalized betrayal of the feminine that we haven't known how to even advocate for our own emotionality, especially when it's an uncomfortable emotion like anger. And men oftentimes don't know what to do with that. Well, okay, if they had a mother who was expressing healthy anger or Mm -hmm. women around them that they grew up with who had some kind of skill, I guess you could say, around the healthy expression of that, But most women, we've been conditioned to be nice. Like, I'm not saying be mean, but let's be honest. You know, we've been conditioned to be nice and sweet. And anything beyond that is just like, what do I do with that? (laughs) But I love that you just use those terms because all my clients say, well, I want to be nice, not mean. And I'm like, wait, 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 what's nice? Do you really want to be nice or do you want to be good? Is enabling people being good? Or is it being nice? And then mean, like if you bring someone some kind of accountability, is that mean or is that good? And if it doesn't sound nice to everyone's ears, whose problem is that? You're just being a mirror. You're just reflecting the truth. And if that's an ugly truth, that's not your fault. And that certainly doesn't make you mean. Yeah. It's almost like you were saying, holding up that mirror and reflecting back to them, but we cannot, it's not up to us to manage their response to our own self-advocacy. Right. So that's, you brought me right into, it's like I planted you here, Sheree. I love it. (laughs) So the number one principle, we talk about boundaries a lot, and I love how boundaries have entered into the vernacular of our society now, but the most important boundary is the one that we will never see. It's invisible. It's that we are only responsible for our own feelings. And there's this big invisible boundary that, Cherie, if you're disappointed with this interview right now, your feelings of disappointment are your responsibility, not mine. And so when we see that, like your feelings belong to you, my feelings belong to me, I am responsible for my feelings. And if I'm disappointed, I need to do something about that. That's not your job. If I'm disappointed with you, then my job is to use my words and be a grown up and say, you know, I'm feeling disappointed. Is there something we can do? And if I'm not willing to do that, then I'm playing a game with you. I'm being manipulative. I am wanting you to see that I'm disappointed without being willing to articulate it like a grown up. And now I'm expecting you to feel responsible for my feelings. And I think as parents, we make that misstep often. You know, we make our children responsible for the way that we're showing up or feeling. I know it takes a lot of centeredness and awareness to not throw that out to other people and project that. I'm curious though, if we could just backtrack with your story a little bit, when you were feeling that betrayal and it was really up for you and you named it and you're like, this is betrayal. And I have a right to feel this anger because I have been betrayed. I think we get gaslit a lot Mm -hmm. when we try to name the betrayal. And I'll give you an example. And you can tell me if this resonates with, because I know that you work with women in religion. You work with women. Who, some of them, most of them are secular, but some, okay. some are. Yeah, 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 for sure. But you are aware of some of the issues surrounding women who are now kind of waking up into these old patriarchal spaces, evangelicals. In my religion yeah. of origin was Mormonism. And when I started to explore my feelings of unease, let's just say, and I really started to do kind of a historical 
data-based, you know, looking at documents, public records. I was really like coming into a very disturbing pattern that I wasn't told about. I was, there were some historical facts that were left out of the narrative sure. of my religion of origin that I felt were so incredibly important that people know. So in my naivety with these new discoveries, I started to talk about it and people were very, very uncomfortable with that. And rightly so, I was uncomfortable discovering it. Mm. But like the reason I bring this up is I felt acute betrayal trauma that I was not shown this. I was so like I had served a mission. I had, you know, spent my life around a certain kind of narrative and a certain kind of, let's just say, trajectory that I was on. And when I found out that there were a lot of discrepancies with that, what I was told versus what the reality was, it was really, really, really jolting. And so yeah. I had to, because other people were uncomfortable with what I was discovering, I had to go, like you were saying like that, it was almost like a depressive, like, oh my goodness, this is my quote unquote cross to bear. This is something I have to internalize and fix inside of myself and come to terms with. And so acute betrayal trauma. So you're saying you felt betrayal from historical piece facts being left out, but then additional betrayal when you shared it with people you thought would feel with you and resonate with you yeah. and they weren't willing to? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, but it's not so much the people that I try to be transparent with. It was the institution itself that didn't offer transparency, but had all the list of expectations without providing the transparency. And so I felt the betrayal from that institution, from the religion itself, from the people who were withholding the information. So the allegiance to the institution then became in question for me. And that's what kind of started me on my path of deconstruction. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of people saying, oh, you shouldn't be upset by that. Or what's the big deal? Like tons of people. It was just absolutely staggering to me that I was being sort of gaslit around nothing to see here, folks. It's okay. Or they would, they would take some concept that I had explored and deconstructed and then change it after the fact. So certain policies were in place, certain doctrines were in place when I was growing up and as I was having children and as I was kind of moving along my religious path of devotion. Mm -hmm. And so I was on a certain path and with certain policies in place. And then during my deconstruction process, they changed those policies, not due to me, <laughs> but other people who were disturbed by those policies. But they never offered why they changed it, what the contextualization. No, no accountability. Right, no right. Account no transparency, no accountability. It's like, we're yeah. just going to go ahead and change that. And so for those of you who have walked through it before, we're not going to offer why we change it. Just God's changing it. So there was just a lot of gaslighting and pain around, well, this was not the narrative I was told. And these were not the policies were in place when I was making certain decisions in my life that shaped those decisions. Had I known that you were going to change it later, I would have made a different decision. So, well, and yeah, so what you're describing though, I mean, it's so interesting because we see that on an individual level too. To me, it's synonymous or analogous to someone like, let's say you're like, well, Bronwyn, I need to talk to you about something you said at the party the other day. It was really hurtful. And if I'm like, oh yeah, well, I was just having a really hard day, Sheree, and I'm not going to say that again. So mm -hmm. that's the betrayal because- Maybe I'm saying I won't do that moving forward, but I'm actually not holding myself accountable. I'm showing no ownership, no insight, no self-awareness, yeah. no apology. So it's the same thing. And when we feel betrayed, our feelings tell us what we need, no matter what our feelings are. When we feel betrayed, it's giving our brains information like, well, if this person is consistently betraying you and now they're not even admitting that they betrayed you, then what do I need? I need to not trust this person, this institution yeah. again. I guess right? that the violation of trust was the most disturbing piece of it. Yeah. I was providing my full trust and my full devotion, but it, that was not being fully reciprocated. And yeah, it's interesting. So I know that you have worked with different groups and that you're saying, you, you know, I were talking before how there's kind of this upswell of women within religions, you could say evangelicals, and I was not raised in the evangelical religion, but it was pretty intensely patriarchal, very intensely yeah. patriarchal. What are you seeing? Like, what are women's voices? What are they needing now within religious spaces that you're noticing? I'm just seeing a whole lot of women, which I am so impressed by, who are like holding on to their faith still, but holding everyone else accountable for a bunch of bullshit. Mm -hmm. And, and how are they doing it. that? How are they navigating that? Well, I am on one 
Facebook group called the Bear Marriage Facebook group. And Bear Marriage is a podcast I subscribe to at a friend's inspiration. And it is a group of evangelical women led by some leaders who, like the leader, Sheila Ray Gregoire, wrote a book called The Great Sex Rescue. Mm. And it's about, so basically she did like very comprehensive research on all these evangelical women across the spectrum. So from fundamentalist to the more progressive, the whole thing. And what they found, among other things, one thing they found is that the most fundamentalist women who subscribe to this notion that evangelicals promote, which is basically sex on demand, like basically like you need to have sex as much as possible to make your husband happy. Mm -hmm. That's your job. Mandatory sex kind of. So those women had about twice the rate of vaginismus as women in the general population. Mm, Interesting. Yeah. So, and they go through like why this is, but like their bodies are reacting to this kind of systematic false teaching. And so what Sheila Ray Gregoire and her research team showed is like, okay, this isn't even in the Bible. So it's bullshit. And look, it's harming women. And the whole idea that women's job is just to put out to make their husbands feel emotionally connected somehow, and that men and women are inherently different. Like, this is nowhere in our sacred text. So where's it coming from? Where did it start? (laughs) Yeah, let's like, let's get some accountability. So it's super refreshing. I don't consider myself an evangelical, but I am Judeo-Christian. And I just love to see this movement because in the Jewish tradition, women are known for having chutzpah. And I (laughs) relate more to Jewish women and I am racially Jewish, but I love the chutzpah. And I want to see that like pervade all women, just like, you know what, why do we have to apologize for being women? Like we get the same voice as anyone else and we get to hold accountability just like everyone else and, and show us the money. Like, where is this in the Bible yeah. anyway? Trace this back. Where did it start? As you were sharing that, it reminded me of when I took my daughter who was then 19, she's 25 now to Africa six years ago this month. And we visited a very remote village, which was very, it was quite disturbing. They actually circumcised females at age four. And the women just look very despondent to me, very detached, but also they have a measure of joy in what they're doing, what they're creating. But there was a village elder and he would spend his time between, I think, about five different wives or women that he claimed were giving him children. And and so I was the person in her group who was like raising her hand. And I was because I was disturbed not only by, by the female circumcision, but, you know, the polygamy, the, the aspect of like we can talk to the tribal elder, but we can't talk to the women. And so um, I asked and I will never forget what his answer was. He said, it's sacred. It's a sacred tradition that we do this, that we circumcise the girls. And it's like, and I was, it's exactly what we're talking about. I'm like, where did this start? In my estimation in the group that I was processing with after it was like, there was probably some village elder X amount of years and years and years ago who maybe he was betrayed and maybe his wife, you know, stepped out on, I don't know, but it's just like somewhere, somehow this tradition started in this remote village in Africa that women are not to have pleasure, that women are the vehicle, like you're kind of describing with this fundamentalism, that women are somehow at the the whim or control of their partner and that he presides and that he's the one that, you know, and it's like, I think now we're just kind of waking up to all of these old ideologies kind of going, yeah, where did this start? And why is it still being perpetuated in, you know, the 21st century here? (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, there, I agree. There is a waking up going on and I am very grateful to be alive right now because even I'm 53 and yeah, there are words entering the vernacular that didn't enter it until very recently, not only boundaries, but like accountability. You hear all these people talking about mental health, people seeking therapy, even 10 years ago, it wasn't like this. Like there's just a huge shift forward into like I don't know. I want to say spirituality, but also like mental health. I don't even know. Like It's holistic- almost like uh, we're reclaiming ourselves. Yeah. So what have you seen with the link between someone not expressing, like externalizing their anger and depression, let's just say? Yes. Freud actually is the one who came up with depression is anger turned inward. Mm-hmm. And he couldn't have been more right on the money. I have found not only depression is anger turned inward, anxiety, panic attacks, mania psychosis. And I've worked with 
all of that. It's all anger turned inward. So our bodies feel anger at some level, even when we're little children, we just know at instinctually when something's wrong, when our parent is betraying us in some way, even if we don't know it cognitively, even if we don't have words for it, we just know like it's wrong and we feel the anger, but we hold it within our bodies usually. And so then we tend as a society, unfortunately, to associate anger with the people who have the outbursts. One type of anger we see, but that's actually people who are are chronically angry at other things and or people who are suppressing anger at the very thing they're most angry at. And then it comes up, bubbling up, volcanoing out at everyone and everything else. Anger, so my goal, because that's my expertise is anger, is to help people connect with their anger to develop a healthy relationship with their anger. We all have anger. What we all need is a healthy relationship with it. Suppressing it's not healthy externalizing it all the time is not healthy. And it starts with just saying, you know what? I'm okay to feel angry right now because this is not okay. Doesn't mean I'm going to explode. It's just okay to feel it. So it starts number one with just that self-validation, that awareness. It's mm -hmm. okay. Even if I don't say anything to this person right now, I'm going to feel the anger. Even yeah. if no one else knows it's there. I do. I know it. I'm not going to suppress it. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm going to feel it. And then the second is, okay, so our feelings tell us what we need. I feel angry. What do I need right now? Okay, so the basic two things are assertive speech and boundaries. Sheree, if you just said something really out of left field that's not okay, me channeling my anger out of my body in a healthy way looks like this. Hey, Sheree, that's not okay to say that. I'm not okay mm -hmm. with that. That's it. That's my anger. I don't have to explode. Yeah. I don't have to attack your character. I don't have to attack anyone. I'm just like, hey, or with my husband sometimes, of course. Hey, Steve, I'm not liking that tone of voice. That's not working for me. Mm -hmm. That's my anger. Yeah. That's the expression and of I, my anger. To just a little bookmark here with the masculine, I've been married almost 30 years and I have three sons and three brothers and a husband. And, and it's like, it's so interesting because I think as women, we are really terrified of male rage. And a lot of us had fathers who were explosive. I mean, my dad was amazing in a lot of respects, but his father was this Irish temper guy and it kind of just went generationally. So, and I read somewhere else too, that women, we do internalize anger more than men because it's more socially acceptable for a man to express anger, almost like it makes him a man to kind of be in that energy. And so there's twice as much depression in women than there is in men. Hey everybody, pardon the interruption, but I'm so excited to tell you about the new Mind Body Soul membership that I'm launching alongside the podcast relaunch. You know, my research and career has focused on depth psychology, emotional healing, mind body science, and how to heal from the inside out through your whole body, through your miraculous multi-sensory pathways. And accessing these sensory pathways is how you heal. So starting April 1st, we're going to dive into this monthly membership where I'm going to give soul-based monthly mental health hacks on the road to emotional mastery. You're going to get a journal. You're going to get a mindfulness mini class every month, guided meditation, anchoring and enlightenment practices, online group coaching, and lots more. And it's super affordable, $12 a month or $100 a year. So just go to shereeburton.com forward slash mind body dash membership. That's shereeburton.com forward slash mind body dash membership. That I believe that I also think, unfortunately, boys are taught not to cry. That makes them a sissy or a baby or whatever. And so I think a lot of men by their out, angry outbursts are actually, that's their version of crying too. Yeah. Good point. That's true because they aren't, they haven't had healthy emotion expression either. It's not been safe for them to show the tender emotion that women right. are validated for. Okay, cool. So we start with just start to interrupt your process. So the first step was... <laughs> Just know it's okay to, to feel, feel it. it, feel it in your body. Like some people feel it in their chest. This is usually where it is. If you feel it in your head, what I would do is tell yourself, you know what, Bronwyn, you don't need to shut it down. Cause this is usually our head is fighting our body's expression of mm. anger. So if you get a headache or tension in your head, I would say it's okay, Bronwyn. It's so okay to feel the anger. You don't have to fight it. You don't have to resist it. You don't have to talk yourself out of it. Just let it be felt in your body. And usually people's tension in their head will go away then and they'll feel it more in their chest. Sometimes 
We feel it in our shoulders, like our shoulders want to rise up and fight. And then a lot of people will feel it in their gut. And what, what I think they, they're really feeling their gut is disgust. Mm. So that's just another variety of anger. It's a response to something objectively disgusting. So when we're really being like gaslit, or if we see, you know, a parent neglecting a child, mm. you know, we feel like in our gut and it's like, that's hatred, that's disgust and it, hatred. Talk about, we're not allowed to feel that, you know, that's something I talk about on my own podcast. Like, you know what? Hatred's just a normal human reaction or response to something that is objectively evil or detestable. There's no shame mm -hmm. with feeling disgust or hatred. If you have a little child and you're walking down the street and the child sees roadkill and they feel disgust, you don't say, hey, Johnny, don't feel disgust. That's a <laughs> bad feeling to have. So then they run and like, you know, scoop it up. No, feel the disgust. It's telling you something. It's yeah. there to inform you, right? Mm. Yeah. So allowing yourself to feel it, locating where it is in your body talking to yourself or having that aware conversation with yourself that it's okay to feel this way. There's, this is part of being human, that kind of thing. I'm also reminded of, and I did a podcast episode on this a few years ago of when Jesus flipped over the tables in front of the temple, that vision of origin, we called it righteous indignation, mm -hmm. which is like right. a very healthy expression of anger. And people don't want to see Jesus that way. They don't want to see a Jesus flipping over tables, <laughs> but that was epic. Because yeah. he was using his platform to the platform of being like the I am, mm -hmm. like you're saying with the disgust that he felt with the money changers in front of the temple as a That's means right. to say, nope, not on my watch. Not, this is just not okay. So I do think, yeah. I think sometimes we can be even too nice with our anger, if that makes sense. Well, like, see, Jesus wasn't nice. He was good. He wasn't yeah, nice. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. You know, yeah. he, in his goodness, in his, I am, there was still an expression, an outward expression that was honestly quite shocking to a lot of people. Well, but then like, if you think about it, if you think, do we want a God or a Jesus that is like detached and apathetic? Right. Like, I'm sorry, but I don't want that. No, we want passion. God. We want a God who's like, that makes me disgusted because it's corrupt. It's wrong. Blah, blah, blah. He was not violent. He overthrew the temples. He did not hurt a person. I love it. And then the other thing he did is he called the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and this is in a shame honor culture in public, a brood of vipers. Mm -hmm. And if you know the reference back to the Hebrew scriptures, that means literally they are the seed of Satan. That is Genesis 3, mm -hmm. where it talks about the seed of the serpent versus the seed of the woman. And he is saying, you guys are the spawn of Satan. That would have been the most to the religious thing establishment. It could have ever been called mm -hmm. in a public shame and honor culture. So yeah, that's awesome. He wasn't nice, but he was good. Yeah, good distinction. Once we've identified it, once we've normalized, or I guess you could, you, you don't even sometimes need to neutralize the anger because even around my kids, I've had to show a degree of anger, like you're saying, that matches the level of this is not okay. And it yeah. really helps them to see, oh, mom, like this is, I don't want to do this again. Like, cause they genuinely didn't know. Yeah. Okay. So once we've named it and we've sort of neutralized it in ourselves to the extent that we can healthily express it, what then? Yeah. So I would feel it in our bodies. And then I say, what am I feeling? Is it disgust? You know, if you're feeling nauseous, yeah, that's disgust or that's hatred and that's okay to feel. And then, you know, if it is the anger in my chest, okay, our feelings tell us what we need. If I'm disgusted, I can say something like, you know, Sheree, that is very disturbing to hear you say that. Mm. So let's say I'm at a religious group, I'm at a religious gathering, and you're saying something that that is a, is like hate speech, yeah. but you think it's okay. So I can say, because I'm feeling disgusted, what do I need right now? I need to let everyone know, or at least this one person, and say, that is really disturbing disturbing to hear that right now. Mm. That's yeah. That's a way to stop the teacher in their tracks, right? <laughs> you know, because yeah. they they cool. sometimes they're just absolutely unaware. They're just following tradition and they're just mm -hmm. repeating the same rhetoric that they've been hearing in all of their circles. And they mm -hmm. honestly don't know. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that there is a groundswell of people who are awakening to some of this hate speech that you're talking about. That if we keep staying silent, 
we're capitulating, we're consenting to it. Yeah, we're enabling it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the establishment of boundaries, like you're talking about, both within ourselves and, and how we show up with others. And then also, like you're talking about assertive speech, just naming it for what it is. What does that do? Like over time, I'm just picturing like putting deposits in a little bank account over time. Have you seen people transform through this process and what have you noticed that it's done for their internal and external world? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, that's a great question. So what it does, the end objective is that we are true to ourselves, that we stop betraying ourselves. Because when I go to a religious gathering and I'm hearing hate speech and I say nothing, I'm betraying myself. I am not being true to myself. And when we continue to do that, we do get depressed. We start feeling like horribly, right? That's the outcome to be. So again, going back to the Hebrew, when you hear the word perfect in the Old Testament, like a perfect sacrifice. Be therefore perfect. Even perfect. Yes. That doesn't mean perfect as we understand it in Western culture. It means the Hebrew tamim. And tamim means integrated. What you see is what you get mm. through and through. There's no compartmentalizing of something over here. We're just whole. We are integrated. And so the goal of like therapy, you know, as a therapist is to help my clients become tamim, integrated, whole. That is what we're doing. So when I do not betray myself, I am acting out in that whole integrated way. And I'm also modeling for other people. I'm not attacking the hater. I'm just saying that's really disturbing. So I'm holding them accountable without attacking their character, without doing any kind of intentional shaming. If they feel shame, that's their problem. I'm not responsible for that. Right. Especially but if you're presenting it with love and power and in, in that mm -hmm. assertiveness and there's love behind it. Yeah. Yeah. So you could say, that's really disturbing. That's not what I expected to hear here. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to hear that in this environment. It doesn't feel like a safe thing to hear. So that would be an example of that, right? That's so powerful. Yeah. And it's not easy to do in some spaces, in a lot of spaces. That is not easy to do. Oh, but <laughs> like if you haven't done it, it's so liberating. Very easy for me these days, I'll tell you. It is so liberating. Yeah. You feel whole. Mm. And then you have some people hate you and some people are like, oh my God, Sheree, thank you for saying that. That happened to me towards, yeah, that started to happen to me when I was the, always the one raising her hand in Sunday school, trying to bring it back to mercy, love and compassion. It was exhausting. Yeah. But then I would have people stop me in the hall and be like, thank you for sharing that. Somebody, mm -hmm. I was sick to my stomach. They literally, this girl was like, I was sick to my stomach until you said that. So mm -hmm. I do think that we... You know, we have to ascertain, like, should I sit in this setting and always be the one raising my hand? Or can I use my voice and others? Because I was shut down by the teacher, literally shut down by trying to do what you said, by trying to advocate. And okay, well, yeah. in that situation, so if we're talking about like for kids, I would say accountability or someone who's an employee, go up the chain of command. We have cell phones. We can audio tape. We can videotape. We can bring about accountability in these institutions. Yeah. So if I'm working with someone who's an employee, I'm like, I would audio tape that exchange with your supervisor and go up above her mm -hmm. and get some accountability. So that's another way we can channel our anger. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes in the larger institutions that have a lot of money and power, you can go all the way up and still be silenced unfortunately. Well, yeah. But we do have, you know, a free press here yes. in our country. And we can so spread awareness that way. And that is what's happening, actually. That's yeah, actually that's actually happening organically. To kind of wrap this up, I want you to hit on something else that you teach. And that's why anger management doesn't usually work. The old anger management models. Yeah. So along those lines, I, I mentioned earlier that I was beyond disappointed with my own experiences seeking out therapists. So many therapists and the therapeutic community today teach anger management. And I'm like, let's get it together, you guys. It doesn't work. Oftentimes what this is, is like these skills, like Cherie, just take some deep breaths and just center yourself and like feel your feet on the floor or Cherie, just feel the feeling in your body or put up a, a stop sign. Just imagine a stop sign, stop your thoughts. And it's all these symptom management. It's symptoms that we're managing just like, you know, the medical establishment only 
manages symptoms too. We don't yeah. get to the root. And so that's how anger management is. And, and what it does- It just that's bypasses, it. right? Yes. It's bypass. Have you heard of spiritual bypassing, oh, by the way? Oh, we talk about all the time on this podcast. Okay. Absolutely. So it is, it's bypassing. But so what it does is manage symptoms at best, but at worst, and, and this this is the case so often, is it's gaslighting that individual. So I will have, you know, someone who come to me for like disordered eating, helping with her disordered eating, who's been to outpatient treatment for eight months, let's say, and they do all these skills, like handle your, regulate your feelings, self-regulation. This is is basically what anger management does too. And, you know, at worst, this is what usually happens is she sees herself as the problem. Mm -hmm. Because if you do that to individuals who, and usually they already believe they're the problem to begin with. So now you're just reinforcing you're the problem. If you could just manage your feelings, everything would go smoothly. And so that's the most toxic piece of this and the problem is usually another person right and so but yeah. they're trying to twist themselves more and more into a pretzel to make this other person happy or for things to go smoothly with some kind of false peace yeah that really resonates and it kind of goes back to what I was illustrating about when I uncovered some disturbing historical narratives and and I wasn't okay with certain policies I just sort of became complicit with it Mm -hmm. for a number of years and didn't speak out to not make waves or to disturb the peace. (laughs) When in actuality, what was happening inside of me was my health Mm -hmm. was suffering. I did a guest sort of presentation on the podcast, Breaking Down Patriarchy, Amy McPhee Alabest on Sacred Rage. And it was this whole thing on, you know, how my swallowing of my words and the women that I've coached and work with were seeing things like thyroid, pervasive Mm -hmm. thyroid issues and some of these autoimmunes because women were very relatable. We want everyone to be happy. We can see the whole picture oftentimes and that embodied wisdom is not always honored in these old spaces. And when you were saying you get a sick or a gut ache in that area, you know, we feel that disgust. That's actually the the chakra that holds our womb wisdom. And so when Mm -hmm. we, when that gets triggered, it's like mama bear chemistry because we're not okay with that happening to our cubs and we're not okay with that happening to humanity. But women, we've had to stifle that, that energy. You know, it doesn't always reveal itself. So yeah, super fascinating. Well, Bronwyn, is there any parting words of advice or wisdom that you would give uh, as we kind of wrap this discussion up that we haven't maybe covered or any, just any last parting thoughts around this whole topic of the healthy expression of anger? Yeah, I would say don't be afraid of all this. I know it can sound so great in theory and you think, oh, if you only knew or, you know, whatever, it can sound intimidating, Mm -hmm. but really, you know, being true true to ourselves makes us whole and that is worth whatever the fallout it really is. But, but also, you know, seek community. So it's not just you being isolated at the end of the day. If you have a friend or two or three or anyone you can be on this journey with, all the better, because you might lose some people in your lives. I say good riddance, honestly. I sleep better now than I ever have in my life. Um, But it is worth it at the end. But, you know, definitely have a partner in crime. Mm, I would totally echo and support and (laughs) that sentiment of finding your true tribe who also may be experiencing similar conflicts, but who are also on the path to being true to themselves. And like you were saying, like not betraying yourself anymore. And there's a lot of us that are arising in that space and it is very healthy and it is very affirming and validating. So where can people find your podcast? You want to say a little bit about that? Yeah. So my podcast is Angry at the Right Things and it is wherever you subscribe to your podcast. The reason I started doing it is one is for people who want to bypass therapy altogether and just skip to the wisdom. Um, Because again, so many therapists are so, so disappointing. That's been my experience. It still is because I have so many clients come to me telling me their horror stories of previous therapists. So if you want to bypass therapy, um, if you want to find a really good therapist, but you want to hit the ground running, knowing what you need and what you want and being informed first. Just to advocate or, for that going into that therapeutic. That's right. Because you're going to need to shop around most likely. So to know, you know, have a bar, have a, a high bar for what you're looking for, the level of wisdom and intelligence you want from your therapist. And then 
And then third would be for someone who is wanting to become a therapist or is a therapist. When I started out, I had no idea what I was doing. So this is also for, you know, budding therapists or even, you know, more seasoned therapists who want a new approach to things. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, I would definitely say that sometimes you do educate as people <laughs> in the field. We, we do educate our experts sometimes and sometimes they're very grateful for it. And that's great. But if they're not, then find another therapist, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much for your time today. This has been really, really enlightening. You're welcome, Sheree. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Hey, it's Sheree here. Have you gotten my free whole body healing kit mini course? All you have to do is ask to join our private Facebook group, Soul Rose Community, and we'll send it right to your inbox. And I want you to know that I am so grateful for every single one of you who listens to these episodes. You can follow me on Instagram at Sheree.Burton to deepen into the discussion that you heard today. And I would be ever so grateful if you would leave this podcast a positive review on Apple Podcasts. This allows many more people to find these kinds of healing and empowerment gems that we bring forward in our discussions. And if you want to see our faces, check out my Soul Rose Show YouTube channel. Have a glorious week and we'll talk to you next time on the Soul Rose Show.